Uh, my name is Kelly Wells. I'm a research scientist in the department and I'm co-organizer of the seminar along with Vasu Sharma. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dylan Malay in a minute here to introduce our speaker, but just want to mention that our next seminar uh, will also be a virtual seminar and it is in three weeks, three weeks from today, and that'll be uh, Dr. Francina Dominguez from uh, the University of Illinois. So uh, I hope to see all of you back again then, uh, but today I'm going to turn it over to Dylan to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Faith Kearns. Okay, thanks Kelly. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. I'm not going to take too much of her time because uh, I think Faith is going to tell us a bit about herself during her talk. Um, but just to kind of set the stage a little bit for her, so Faith is originally from Arizona. She got her bachelor's degree in beautiful Flagstaff, Arizona at Northern Arizona University, and then her PhD in streamwater ecology at UC Berkeley. And uh, since then, she's worked in a number of positions as a scientist and, and practitioner of science communication uh, at UC Berkeley. She was a science policy fellow at the Department of State. At the, she worked at the Pew Charitable Trusts, and right now she's at the California Institute for Water Resources. Um, so she, her recent book, Getting to the Heart of Science Communication, which you should all buy if you haven't already purchased it, uh, was published in May and it's been featured in Science Magazine and Booklist and Grist and a lot of other places. Um, so I've known Faith since we started grad school in the same year at Berkeley and I just couldn't be more excited to welcome her here. So Faith, thanks for coming and uh, for speaking to us today and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for the introduction, Dylan. Um, it's good to see you. Always good to catch up with grad school friends. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's see, start this presentation here. So give me a second to. All right, can everybody see what I'm see my presentation? Okay, so. Um, so uh, as Dylan said, I'm Faith Kearns. Um, I'm a science scientist and science communications practitioner. And I work in the California Institute for Water Resources, which is located in um, the University of California's Division of Ag and Natural Resources, which is also known as Cooperative Extension, which will be familiar to those of you um, in the land grant system as you all are. So thank you to Dylan um, for inviting me and to Kelly for organizing this. Um, and to those of you who are sort of listening, engaging with this material today, um, I'm coming to you from the beautiful lands of the Ohlone people who continue to shape this um, place we call the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. So today I just want to talk a little bit about a different way of communicating science than what has generally been talked about for most of my career, which has been spent doing communications for longer than I've been a scientist and doing science communication since before it really had that name. And so although I am a scientist, I'm very much coming at this particular talk as a, a communications practitioner for the past 25 years or so. And as Dylan said, you know, I've practiced in academia, particularly in the cooperative extension system, in government and nonprofit. Um, and I work primarily on water and climate change and wildfire issues. So just to give a little context for the ideas I want to talk about, I'm going to start a little bit, uh, start with a brief story. So about 15 years ago, I was a scientist. I was not long out of graduate school when I had this really career and, and sort of life altering experience talking with this man who was in tears at a community workshop. Um, at the time I was working in this wildfire research center at Berkeley. Um, and we were in a small Northern California town for what's called a fire safety demonstration day. We were at a fairgrounds um, and we had just sort of presented this information from our research on things people can do to prevent home loss during wildfires. And, you know, it, it, this is uh, more familiar work these days, but at the time it was pretty sort of cutting edge. It was basically indicating that houses could be built to withstand wildfire, which at that time wasn't quite the issue that it is now. And so from a science perspective, um, this was pretty straightforward stuff. We had a lot of really great research and some really nice tools to try to make our work accessible. We were doing everything we were supposed to do as community engaged scientists. We were talking with local firefighters and communities, the state legislature, um, and just doing all the things we sort of thought we were supposed to do, right? Um, and that day, we were also talked a little bit about a very controversial idea, which is called a stay or go policy that's um, common in Australia, where instead of being evacuated, families are trained to um, 
and have the option to kind of stay with their homes during wildfire since wild since firefighters may not always be able to protect every home. And as you can imagine, this idea of staying with your house um, as a wildfire rages around you can can raise a lot of like literal life and death feelings for people. Um, and honestly, a lot of intrigue because people are super also interested in fire. So again, from a sort of research perspective, it's a somewhat common sense idea that that this might work. But in a story that will sound very familiar at this point, um, even though it wasn't at the time, uh, that same year, we were there in the fall, but earlier that summer, there had been these two large wildfires um, in, in burning around Big Sur. And then also in where we were at the time in Mendocino County, where this 18 complex wildfire had started. And both of these sets of fires threatened homes and communities were being evacuated and firefighting resources were really strained because these weren't the only fires burning at the time. There were another 30 right uh, all around the state and people were, you know, really emotional about the fire situation. Um, again, very familiar these days. So here we were right we were we were in this place talking to these people who had just lived some of the dilemmas that we were talking about in our research about evacuation and some people were sad some were angry, some were afraid, others were anxious. Um, and basically, um, you know, this man I was talking to shared with me how powerless he felt having to leave his house after many exhausting hours spent moving equipment and farm animals. And he was unsure that staying would have helped much, um, but also felt very bad about evacuating. And just listening to our presentation had re-triggered his trauma from the fire. Um, something that despite my own experiences with trauma, I had never thought about in the context of my scientific work at all. Um, and again, this can seem somewhat uh, more natural these days. Uh, 15 years ago, it really, really wasn't. Um, and I think it's still deeply uncomfortable for many people today. So really um, listening to this man uh, was the first time that I became acutely aware that my scientific training really didn't prepare me for the strong emotions uh, for a about research that has immediate meaning in people's lives. And so I'm really grateful because talking with him inspired more than a decade of work to understand how science and emotion can be integrated because the truth is that, you know, our lack of attention to the feelings of the people in the room that day were really detrimental to them and to us and ultimately truly to our work. And so that's what led me to focus on communication in emotional and contentious environments. And so um, at this point, I just want to give an overview of the talk so you know where we're headed. Um, my main thesis for this work is really that relating is a key part of the communication challenge that has been largely overlooked in scientific and technical communication efforts. And everything I'll be talking about today is covered in my book, Getting to the Heart of Science Communication, but I'm only going to talk about a small subset of what's included there. So I'm going to talk really specifically about um, the evolving practice of science communication um, and how we can re refocus uh, for sort of 21st century science communication with tools like relating, listening, working with conflict and understanding trauma. And then I'm going to close with a conversation about uh, equitable, inclusive and just science communication and as well as how we can take care of ourselves in this kind of work. Um, and I just want to express uh, gratitude to everybody who who spoke with me for this book um, and whose words I can now share with you. So just some context. Um, I like to start with a pretty basic definition of science communication. Um, we tend to assume that people know what we mean when we're defining things, but uh, I, I find it's really important to just lay the groundwork that when I say science communication, I'm talking in a very broad way about communicating science with non-experts. And the caveat that I try to add to that is that it, that is most of us most of the time, right? So I'm trained as an ecologist, and that does not make me an epidemiologist. And so therefore, I feel like we should have a lot of empathy um, as being the recipients of science communication work and help us to evolve our own practice, right? Um, and I will say, you know, science communication does have this sort of long global history, and there's some people doing some really interesting work about that. But for myself, um, I really just wanted to focus on what I know, which is uh, the last sort of 25, 30 years in North America and particularly in the United States. Um, and so 
the, during my career, science communication really had, has tended to focus on performance. So when I say performance, I'm really talking about this idea of how to give a good talk, how to, you know, make a good presentation, how to, how to frame and message and things like that. And while those things have their role, that is certainly not all that there is to say about science communication. It's also tended to focus on filling an information gap, right? Just giving people information can sometimes be seen as science communication. Um, and then the other piece is that, uh, again, in my career, there's been this real focus on connecting often elite scientists at elite institutions with elite journalists and decision makers at elite institutions. So, you know, the, the epitome of science communication, good science communication was often seen as, you know, an Ivy League faculty member talking to a, a reporter at CNN or something like that. And what I want to argue is that a more ground level science communication practice has existed at the same time, but it's really taken a back seat to these sort of more top down approaches, right? So this um, sort of sage on the stage model has really proliferated. And but, you know, at the same time, we've mostly found that, of course, um, you know, the last few years have shown information is very important, um, but on its own, it doesn't really offer that much of a theory of change. And, you know, I, I definitely recognize the irony that I'm sort of performing that role right now. It's a really challenging thing to get away from. Um, and yet, uh, you know, 90 percent of my job is not spent spent doing this kind of thing. Um, so what I've learned from that other set of work is that, you know, in reality, people communicate with each other in really complex ways, configurations and places. Even the newly um, favored term two-way communication doesn't really cover it. It's more like this vast communication ecosystem with many varied conversations and connections. And I think we all know that on some level. And yet, um, you know, many times our science communication work doesn't reflect that. And, and that is truly because it's hard. It's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to, to go beyond that model. It takes a lot of work and a lot of investment. And so we are starting to see this sort of shift toward a more what I call relational or community engaged model, uh, which is really much more about, you know, the people that we are in community with and the communities they're a part of. And um, if you take that kind of thing seriously, it's just a really fundamentally different prospect and a different set of skills that people need. Um, in addition, there's been a real change in the people doing science communication work. Long considered the domain of tenured faculty, science communicators are increasingly in precarious positions. They're interested in often part of various communities that have been marginalized within the sciences. Um, and this diverse group is also changing science communication practice by challenging notions of objectivity and advocacy in science. So for example, Sada Kahanamoku, who's a doctoral student at UC Berkeley um, wrote about the 30 meter telescope. To me, this debate is not about science versus culture. In my practice of science, the two are inextricably linked. I am Kanaka Aoi and I do science because I am Hawaiian. I research out of Aloha Iina, a deep familial love for the land and my cultural upbringing allows me to walk in the space between Western science and traditional ways of knowing, the duality that enriches the questions I ask and the techniques I use to answer them. Um, in addition, many of these science communicators are less interested in relying on scientific authority and sort of intellectual distance as tools. They're instead very interested in connection and consent. So for example, um, Sarah Myrie, who is a climate scientist uh, in Washington State told me, the paradigm of science communication has largely been about the appropriate presentation of scientific authority, which is about divesting from your own uh, mortal and emotional and human connections. You're forced to perform respectability, to posture, and when you try to critique that posture or even just do things differently, you become the problem instead of the thing that's actually a problem, right? She's reflecting some work by the feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed with those words. Um, and indeed, the, the questions, approaches, outcomes that these science communicators are seeking are quite different from what I would say uh, the practice I was sort of indoctrinated into. Many, many of these folks live in the commun same communities as the people they work with, myself included. Um, and that's just a fundamentally different prospect, that uh, proposition than science and communication that takes place sort of outside of any direct ties to communities. So Mila Marshall, who's a doctoral student at the University of Illinois, Illinois, for example, told me that emotional intelligence and cultural understanding are key in science communication. 
and said, you know, these are deep issues. People are sometimes relying on misinformation. When you're talking about difficult subjects, you have to understand you're asking people to acknowledge there's a chance something they believe to be true told to them by people they love and respect is wrong. We can provide accurate information, but there also has to be somebody standing in the gap prepared to support them through their emotions around how it feels to be corrected and the embarrassment of going hard for what you thought was the truth. And <clears throat> In my mind, this is one of the smartest things that somebody said to me in, in the course of writing this book. And I really struggle with how to take uh, what Mila said seriously, because uh, I think it's really important. And finally, I spend a whole chapter of the book discussing science communication careers because I really feel like we're at a turning point. So at this stage, most people with scientific training uh, will end up working outside of academia versus within it, right? Um, and so the interest in science communication careers is increasing both because people um, feel the urgency of a lot of the issues that we're facing um, and also because the job market is what it is. Um, and at the same time, science communication training, <laughs> much less a science communication career, is really not legible to most graduate students. So, for example, Julian Reyes, who now is uh, the Climate Hub's national coordinator at the USDA, told me, um, I would have liked to have more science communication training as an explicit part of my training. I think graduate students are navigating the field in a piecemeal fashion that's too dependent on circumstances and a sympathetic advisor. It's not particularly equitable. And that's something I heard from a lot of graduate students that it's, you, you, you kind of fall into this work and get lucky to be able to do it, which is a sad state of affairs. Um, I would say, you know, many students are also looking to have like science communication direct experience as part of their graduate training, not just a course, but really an immersive experience. And so Priya Shukla, who's a graduate student at UC Davis, was lucky enough to be part of a program that allowed her to spend the summer working for the science communication group Compass. Um, and now that she's back in, in graduate school, she says the experience changed her views on science um, policy and communication significantly. And, you know, she says that I'm back from having dipped my toes in the policy pool. And then I hear the kind of advice academics who haven't done any policy work themselves give to students. And I am able to reflect on it more deeply, Priya says generously. Um, <laughs> I now feel much better equipped to start to think about those specific implications of my research. I couldn't have learned that by sitting at my computer looking at models. Um, and if you think finding your way as an early career science communicator uh, is challenging, um, try being a mid-career science communicator. Um, unfortunately, many science communicators work is undervalued, underpaid, and underprotected. Um, because indeed, uh, science communicators are often working on what can be pretty emotional and contentious topics. So we've got things like the things I work on, water and wildfire, uh, drought, and climate change. And of course, the issue that has made the reality of science communication complexity legible for many more people, and that is COVID. Um, it used to be pretty hard for me in a lot of ways to explain the need to this for this kind of approach to science communication. But I think COVID has made it clear how science is a political and cultural issue, as many of us have long argued. So um, that stuff is, uh, you know, the, setting the stage. I want to give a couple of concrete examples of the ways that, you know, emotion can show up in some of this work. So uh, Sarah Wolf, who's faculty at the University of Waterloo in Canada, works on rec uh, recycled drinking water. And she says, you know, human emotions are complicated. So talking about them is never easy. But given the many and multiplying stresses on our drinking water systems, it's time to stop ignoring how powerful and universal emotions such as disgust both both help and hinder our water decisions, right? So she's saying people are disgusted by the idea of drinking recycled water, and that actually has policy and science implications. Um, Parisa Parsifar says something similar based on her work, where she says early experiences of disgust and fear are linked to water contamination beliefs and water consumption behaviors among children. Although these might seem like individual issues, fear and disgust can have far-reaching consequences, including things like dehydration and other public health concerns. 
Um, and again, these issues are even more amplified when you live in the community where you work, right? You're facing the same issues. You see the people that you're talking with at the grocery store. It becomes sort of a, a deep issue of accountability. So Sarah Watson, who uh, works also in another extension program, Sea Grant in South Carolina, says, I recently had recently gave um, several presentations on the local effects of sea level rise to groups like homeowners associations. And at least each time, at least half the people there were completely freaked out. I now get nervous having to say out loud what these climate projections tell us about tidal flooding in the region. It's hard information for communities to hear for what is often the first time. And it's hard for me to give the same bad news over and over again. News that I increasingly worry isn't bad enough to cover where we're headed, but that I simultaneously worry sounds too alarmist for what people are ready to hear. And so while these can be very challenging issues and situations, um, I will note there's also joy to be found. So for example, my colleague Malika Noko, um, who is at UC Davis, uh, created co-created something called Plant Love Stories and says, we created Plant Love Stories because we wanted to focus more on plant appreciation than science and just make it fun. It makes me feel joyful and light. It makes me feel like I can be funny. I have all these parts of my personality that I feel like I have to suppress for science. But with this, I can be goofy and make puns and be a total plant nerd and it's okay. So with all of that context, um, I basically uh, want to propose that we think about a new set of tools in science communication. And I'm going to go over four of them that I think about as sort of a starter, a starter kit for thinking about a more relational or connected science communication. So um, sorry, my computer is a little slow. Relating is the first one that I want to talk about. So my, my basic sense is that we really are in a lot of ways in the sciences facing what I would say is more of a relationship challenge than a communication challenge. Um, and it's much more about how we relate to each other as equals um, rather than, for example, pushing behavioral change onto others because we um, assume to be the objective experts know best. And relating in this way really invites different skills, um, including the ability to listen deeply rather than speak perfectly and work with emotions that come up when listening well. Um, relational work itself uh, is present in many cultures and spiritual traditions. Um, in addition to say black feminist scholarship, for example, many indigenous um, scholars from Kim Talbert to Zoe Todd write about relationality. Um, I interviewed Melanie Yahtzee, who's at the University of New Mexico. And she told me that she uh, developed this concept of radical relationality um, by working on the water is life movement, she says, I noticed that with water is life, the word life in particular was about countering the politics and reality of death that resource extraction has brought to native communities, including my own. I call these relations of extraction one way relationships where resources are extracted from native community from native lands with no benefits to native peoples. That leads us into this radical politics of relationality based on indigenous understanding of kinship, of relatives, of being in good relations of reciprocity. It is about mutual respect and simply being a good relative. Um, in addition, I myself have learned a lot from the many professions, including law and medicine, and particularly psychotherapy that have developed what are called sort of professional relationship-centered approaches. Um, Theopia Jackson, a psychologist, practicing clinical psychologist and, and professor at Saybrook University, for example, um, told me about her work and how she thinks about working relationally. And she says, I can think of my practice as a service model where I frame my efforts around being in service of others. That means I can't come at it from a place of being an expert with all the answers, right? This is very antithetical to a lot of science training. Um, and she says, instead, maybe I come at it from a place of asking, what do you need? Here's what I can offer. Is this helpful? If so, how do I make it accessible? And if not, what do you need that I might be able to provide? Those are guiding questions for working relationally. And um, Dr. Jackson is definitely one of my mentors and I take the questions that she poses really seriously. Um, so what, again, <laughs> to make this more concrete, what does this kind of look, work look like? So one story I can tell comes from my colleagues at UC Cooperative Extension. Um, during our last 
long drought, which I am always saying might be the same drought that we're currently in now, um, small Hmong farms on leased land in California's Central Valley exp experienced a mental health crisis that was spurred on by low water allocations. And my colleagues asked what they could do to help. And though it wasn't work they would have done initially, initially they basically changed their entire approach and uh, went into a sort of all hands on deck moment to, to um, do work that was needed. And so uh, Ruth Dahlquist Willard, who's a UC Cooperative Extension Small Farms Advisor, for example, told me that, you know, we ended up holding these multilingual workshops to inform growers of a state grant process to help with energy efficiency on water pumps and get them started on their applications. Then we offered one-on-one -on -one assistance for completing the application and getting all the required documents together, right? This is huge. These are um, Ruth is actually an entomologist and, you know, basically had to change her entire sort of work to, to do more technical assistance because it was what was needed by the community she works with. And by doing that, growers were able to save up to 65% on water and electricity bills with their new equipment. Michael Yang, who works with Ruth and who is Hmong himself, you know, said, especially for these Hmong farmers, water is crucial to grow crops like lemongrass, lufa, long beans, and sugar cane. It was wonderful to see crops grow lush and green because we had water. Another example comes from colleagues in Southern California who were tasked with developing a project to gain a better understanding of how communities use their water and how water agencies can better serve them. But instead of assuming they knew best, they developed um, an approach that centered not just community needs, but their strengths as well. Um, Mike Antos, who works with Stan Tech, an engineering firm, said, we framed it as a strengths and needs assessment to overcome the deficit model of thinking and we centered listening as a key process. It's important to elevate community expertise to be on, far, on par with agency expertise. Expertise. <laughs> we have to get past the we know what they need model of resource management. So um, Emily Brooks, who, who was a graduate student at the time at UC Irvine and worked with Mike said basically, you know, the idea was that locals were the best experts on their own community strengths, needs and strengths they live in and move through these places every day and have experience and knowledge that isn't accessible to outside experts like water planners. Um, an important goal of the project was to find out how water agencies could best support people they didn't often hear from, which includes the homeless and renters, because so much agency outreach is to homeowners. Um, they basically developed an, an anthropology-based ethnography to ethnographic approach to listening and figuring out what these agencies could do better. And Valerie Olson, an anthropologist with um, UC Ir Irvine, basically said, you know, we found the community is far from monolithic and therefore does not experience water in the same way and agencies needed more specific specific interventions. So for example, they found that while managers and communities might have a common goal of safe drinking water, managers rely on tests that tell them the water is safe, but communities rely on taste or smell, which can lead to a disconnect. And this is often a huge um, uh, source of mistrust within the water field. Um, and they also found that, for example, language posed a barrier. The agency sort of thought they had it covered because they had on-call translation services, but they were really burdensome for users. And this listening project basically surfaced the the idea that they needed to hire multilingual staff as a priority. Um, and these agencies are actually in the process of completely adjusting the way they had been approaching some of these issues based on that work. And just one caveat that while listening is a beautiful practice, um, it's also important to recognize it has a ton of ethical challenges um, during what can be a very extractive process, which you know scientists are very good at um, in many ways. So listening is often diluted to come be to become about empathy and compassion when we're talking about justice and accountability. Yana Lam Bernadou, who's an anthropologist at Smith College, told me. Um, Yana is actually one of the only person I, people I know, perhaps the only person I know who's taught listening professionally in a university setting to scientists and engineers, um, and says how scientists and engineers listen is inseparable from questions of power, because it can be done in ways that bolster community knowledge and strengthen scientific understanding of real world problems, but it can also be done in ways that overlook or distort community knowledge and compromise scientists' ability to help in ways that are scientifically sound and experienced is de desirable and just. Um, and so Yana's saying we basically can't just switch to these methods and hope that, that, that you know, they'll be more ethical. We have to actually work on the ethics of these things. 
Um, another tool uh, in the toolbox for modern science communicators, I think, is 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 dealing with conflict, um, working on being uh, comfortable with discomfort, right? So when it comes to conflict, it's really challenging because while many people are conflict averse, um, other people really love it. And it's valuable to see that those are two sides of the same coin, right? Both, both approaches give conflict a lot of power. And what I argue for is really this more middle path of increasing comfort with conflict. But I also want to note that doesn't apply equally, right? So if you're somebody with relative power who avoids conflict, uh, you might want to uh, stretch your conflict muscle by punching up a bit. Um, like I said, it's a complex topic. Um, however, in science communication, we tend to treat conflict as something that can be defeated with information, which if you think about it for even a minute, just isn't how it works at all. So one of my favorite experiences was watching a colleague go from conflict avoidant to realizing that he needed ethically to be okay with it. Um, as I talked about some of what I'm talking about with you now, uh, Mark Thorne said, you know, he basically went from feeling like climate change wasn't a topic that he could talk with the often conservative ranchers he works with to feeling like he really had an ethical obligation to talk with them about it. It was pretty amazing. So he said, you know, the consequence of avoiding talking about the effects of climate change on ag production has too many negative consequences for the people I work with and for food security in general at the local, regional, and national levels. And I now see it as a professional and ethical obligation to talk about what can be difficult topics. And I have to describe, uh, trust that the long-term working relationships I have are strong enough to handle it. Um, and this is a huge benefit of working relationally is that you hope when things are difficult that you can actually um, work through them. Uh, another thing to think about with conflict, however, is power. So Linda Mendez, who is now a new faculty member at the University of Denver told and works on the issue of power, basically told me, um, I think focusing on better communication is distracting. And in many ways, she's right. Um, there are these much larger issues of power at stake, and it's convenient to have a lot of very smart people worrying instead about communication. We were talking very specifically about climate change. Um, there's definitely some truth to the idea of intentionally letting people fight over the discourse instead of the essence of important policies and processes. So um, the, the sort of final tool in the toolbox that I want to talk about is understanding trauma, which um, for many of the issues that, that we all work on is pretty ubiquitous this, these days. Um, so Tessa Hill, who's faculty at UC Davis, um, told me early on the morning of October 9, 2017, we awoke to multiple friends asking us if we were evacuating. We launched ourselves out of bed, turned on the TV, and pulled up social media feeds and began a frantic hour of messaging friends and family, trying to understand the wildfire chaos around us. By daylight, we noticed that some of the ash was as big as our hands and had legible writing on it. Other large pieces falling into our yard were burned fabric. The remnants of our community were falling from the sky. That fire erased our sense of safety, not just at the individual level, but across our county. It was a community scale trauma. She's talking about the Tubbs fire there. And I think, you know, this has huge, um, in, it has a huge impact for how we think about communicating scientific issues, um, particularly where trauma is involved. Um, and while it's valuable to understand that trauma can be a part of this work, it's also incredibly important to be culturally responsible when thinking about it. Um, not everyone experiences it the same or accepts the label of having been traumatized or being in a traumatic situation. So again, Dr. Jackson says part of the challenge with the trauma bucket is that it's become a catch-all phrase that means different things to different people. It's important not to position people who are dealing with significant issues as having something less about them. Some folks are quite adept and functional despite the context they live in. Their world is often much more in perspective. It's also important um, to think about not just how trauma affects other people, but also how it affects us as scientists and communicators. Um, you know, people who are communicating about these issues year after year um, often are experiencing the trauma themselves and communicating about it. So understanding the way sort of it affects us and others and the combination is really important. Um, Miriam Kia Keating, who's a 
psychologist at UC Santa Barbara uh, told me just understanding that there is a psychological impact from something like disasters is a valuable. Recent events have opened my eyes to the personal distress that researchers and professionals have been experiencing. Those who help communities respond to disaster can experience secondary or vicarious trauma. And just to add to that, um, this is an issue that I think, again, is really important in the sort of science communication realm, which is understanding how our own trauma histories affect the way that we think about and work on these issues. Um, and again, I think psychologists are ahead of the game here and have some tools that we could learn from. Dr. Jackson says, you know, for example, I might be a therapist working with you, but I want to be curious about my own trauma history. My work with you around your trauma exposes me to trauma. It can inadvertently add to things like, you know, me feeling bad for you versus empathizing with you. And so, and sometimes people who are helping are helping out of their own desire to help someone as opposed to seeing what that person needs. And then they get their feelings hurt when somebody doesn't accept the beautiful thing brought to them. These are the kinds of things that can come up if professionals aren't aware of their own trauma. Um, and I would say this is definitely something I see quite a bit. So uh, just to start to wrap up, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what I see as, as sort of issues moving forward. Um, a big one is obviously equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, so uh, for most of my career, science communication training really tended to treat all communicators if they are the same, um, offering a genetic, a generic set of tools that was assumed to work the same for everybody. But to some of my earlier points, this is obviously not the case. Um, science communicators are diverse groups working with diverse communities. And this, again, just fundamentally changes how we think about science communication practice. Um, as just one example, Sergio Avila, who works with the Sierra Club in Southern Arizona, told me about working with ranchers um, in Mexico and Arizona, and how he as a scientist really had to change um, how he communicates to, to be good at this work. And he said, you know, too often scientists create language that is actually meant to exclude people. We build ourselves up as the experts and then we're supposed to dumb down or simplify our language, which just leads to more feelings of superiority, which is a really, really interesting and important comment um, on the current, uh, the current a way we do science communication and sort of this idea of translating and such. So um, again, I think uh, Sergio's work is something I also struggle to take very seriously on a sort of daily basis. Um, and uh, that kind of exclusivity, I guess, can show up in, in multiple ways that Kian Dawson told me um, can sometimes at least um, begin to be addressed with behavioral change interventions. So he said, you know, when, when medical professionals change their language to talk about bodies and not genders, it's immediately seen as more inclusive by the trans community. These are small, uncomplicated language changes using terms like parents, pregnant people, things that are not tied to male or female identities. So people say we have to wholesale change every Everything, but I can't renovate the whole house at once. It's not livable. You have to work on multiple scales at once. And I will say in the, the process of this book that that interview with Kian was one of the most interesting because I tend to um, have strange feelings about behavior change work because it's so often manipulative. But um, the way they explain this to me, it just felt like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Sometimes you really do need um, a hammer and um, even more simply, uh, Gabi Serrato Marx, who's a scientist and, and freelance communicator, basically told me, point blank, sci inaccessible science communication is not open, equitable, or inclusive, right? So again, these are, these are things that I um, am working on on a daily, daily basis. Um, and given that this work is essentially a full body sport at this, at this stage, um, it's becoming increasingly important to talk about self-care. But rather than approaching it from a sort of individual perspective, I really wanted to highlight folks who are sort of integrating their self and community care. So Lydia Jennings, who's a postdoc now at the University of Arizona, having recently graduated, um, is someone I respect deeply for the work that she does. <clears throat> Um, as a soil scientist studying mining remediation, but she's also a trail runner who's really excited about all things outdoors and has really managed to sort of integrate her work into a trifecta she describes as being a sort of indigenous trail running scientist that allows her to combine her love of science and nature with some of her uh, concerns about the world. 
So um, Lydia told me that, you know, I love to be outside. I love learning more about the world every day. And I'm also committed to being an active part of a more just future. For me, science is about service, particularly for marginalized communities. And that kind of service is an incredible responsibility with some thorny issues like land dispossession and data sovereignty that require a lot of patience and commitment. Um, so what I've described here is really just the tip of an iceberg that I hope is, um, you know, leading to at least one force leading to some change in the way we think about what science communication work is. Um, and so the question I, I pose at the end of my book and that I would pose to you now is, you know, really what more is possible when we reimagine scientific, technical, and research communication and engagement as relational and just? Um, I think we had gotten to a bit of a stagnation point in the science communication conversation uh, <clears throat> over the last decade um, and, and people were sort of stalling out. But I actually think that, that we're really just at the beginning of um, trying to really think more deeply about what science communication looks like when we untie it from issues of performance and um, move into relating. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and leave you with information about how to keep in touch. Um, anybody uh, is feel, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, and I look forward to talking with you all and I'm open to some questions for the next uh, bit of time that we share together. All right, thank you so much, Faith. To stop sharing here. All right. Are there questions? Folks can either type them in the chat and I'll, I'll keep an eye on that, or you can feel free to just unmute and ask as well. I'll ask a question. I'm curious, Faith, to know about what you, what was the um, was there a particular moment when you decided that you wanted to go down this career path was for sort of focusing on science communication? Mm -hmm. I think I think when I first realized it could be a job, which is when I um, right after undergrad, I had you know been doing this communications work in the athletics department at my university and then was also a science major and um, could have just as easily continued working in marketing. <laughs> um, I didn't really know what I was going to do because this was, there was no clear career path, but one of my professors um, handed me this, you know, te old telnet <laughs> email, speaking to how old I am at this point, um, of a job announcement for an internship with the Ecological Society and their public affairs office. And it basically described what I wanted to do, uh, which was sort of doing communications work about science. And I applied for that job and I luckily got it. And that kind of, and, and that led to an actual permanent position with the Ecological Society doing that kind of work for a couple of years. And, um, yeah, and then it just, it had to unfold from there because um, as I said, like science communication wasn't even called science communication really until around 2000. So it was not, uh, there was really no clear career path at all, but I just kind of ended up going with what I really enjoyed doing, even though I think people thought it was a little wild that I was interested in both of these things that seem so disconnected. Again, seems obvious now in the mid nineties, it wasn't. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so in our earlier conversation, you mentioned how you think about, you know, your quote audience and that the term the public is not really a useful framework for thinking about like, you know, you're not doing a one-way communication from like the experts to the masses. Can mm -hmm. you just talk a little bit more about that? And you know, how that might vary depending on, you know, what your role is as a science communicator. There's so many different mediums that we can all work in, um, different products that we can create. 
Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that that I really try to make clear in the book is that I'm not trying to define kind of the science communication. I think there are multiple science communications. And so, you know, as you allude to, Amy, there's there's so many different ways of thinking about what this work is. But where I'm really trying to come at it from is is a saying, you know, that kind of a very top down science communication will obviously continue, right? There's no, that work is not going to go away, but I was very interested in describing a different sort of subset of the science communication world that I think hasn't seen much daylight. (laughs) And so, you know, when I think about, um, you know, science, science communication, the way I do it, which is much more at a sort of I I work in the state of California at a statewide level um, and on very specific water, water and wildfire and climate issues. And so for me, um, there's there's absolutely actually no way for me to think about the quote unquote public um, because I, I am so integrated into the work that I'm doing that um, I, you know, think about it much more as um very specific communities of people, you know, like even so, so, you know, I work in cooperative extension, so we have an agricultural audience, right? But even within, within agriculture, it's extremely complex, Um, you know, like people will just even talk about farmers or growers or producers as a monolith. They are not, not even a little bit, right? Even the the sort of story I told about the mom farmers, we've got small scale farmers, we've got, you know, people growing all sorts of different commodities, all of that kind of stuff. And I think the more you do science communication work, if you're really trying to say something specific and change something specific, um, you have to think very directly about who you're talking with. Are you talking about water agencies? And if you're talking about water agencies, are you talking about urban water agencies or rural um, water agencies or irrigation districts? Or, so I guess, you know, when I think about it, I just, it's um, the, the term public is, is, it really is irrelevant for me. Um, you know, it gets a little bit narrow, uh, better when people refer to publics, even though I think that's sort of an insider academics way of thinking about things. Um, so yeah, just like people will say, you know, I, um, you, with any broad categorization, you want to be able to speak. If you're the, the closer you are to an issue, the more you want to be able to speak directly to the people that you're working with. Um, and so, um, Dylan jumped off, but you know we have a, a colleague in graduate school, Jason Delborn, who who actually did some work on the more theoretical work on what an audience is um, in the context of theater and improv. And it's super interesting. There is some deep theoretical work on how you think about what an audience is. That does not show up in science communication conversations at all. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally open to these like nuanced um, conversations about what an audience or what a public is, but that's just tends to not be the way that we talk about it. And I think the more advanced you get in your career, at least for me and the way I do my work, I just, those terms like almost make me feel cringy because I just can't think of people that I know and work with as like my audience or my public. It's just like, you know, (laughs) there are people that I work with and that's, that's who I communicate with. I saw, I think I saw there was another question. Yeah. There's a question from Emma Link in the chat. Do you want, do you want to just read it, Faith? Sure. It says the type of extension work you're describing here is very interesting to me. And I think it is not how extension work is thought of or done everywhere. How would you recommend someone prepare and search for this sort of work? So that's a good question. Um, So when I'm talking about extension work, I'm talking specifically about cooperative extension um, in the United States, right? I'm not talking about international um, extension work. Um, And then um, this is a really complicated topic in some ways because uh, those of us who work at land grant universities, right, um, are, can often be associated with a particular college that's the sort of land grant piece of things. Um, And then there are other folks who, so in California, for example, um, we have faculty who are on several campuses who are cooperative extension faculty um, or what's called ag experiment faculty. And they tend to be fairly far removed from 
cooperative extension practice unless they um, intentionally seek it out. And then we have a sort of another set of roles, which are cooperative extension specialists, which are faculty that tend to, but not always interact more directly with the cooperative extension component, which is really technically supposed to be the county based um, personnel of the cooperative extension system where we've got, you know, in California, we've got an office in almost every county in the state, and we have what are called ag advisors, um, or, you know, farm advisors or natural resource advisors. Um, in a lot of other places, they're called agents. And those roles can be fairly different where I think, you know, in some states, those agents are essentially doing tech transfer. Uh, in California, uh, almost everybody who's an academic advisor or faculty or whatever does research um, and does extension work. And so with that, with that as context, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, you really have to research the corporate extension system of the particular state that you might be interested in working in. It is fairly different everywhere. And the other thing that I would say is in terms of recommending and preparing, um, I think the best thing that I can recommend to folks is reach out to cooperative extension folks in your system um, or a system that you, you know, work in and try to figure out how you can work directly with those people. They're often super, super interested in working with students. I know it's, it's a constant issue for us that um, we as the sort of cooperative extension branch don't have graduate students or any students. And so we're sort of reliant on our campus based component to connect us with students and people are super excited always to, to, to work with students. And I, so I think it's really, you know, I, I would, again, just argue it's really relational and just kind of reaching out with people to people. I, this is how I got involved is I actually just started doing a cooperative extension project and meeting actually many of the people I work with today uh, during my graduate training. And I think that's more than more than even other components, that's that's a big part of it. And then I would say if you haven't, you know, done some of that stuff, I think people who are hiring into extension are always, always looking for people who um, are going to be interested in sort of community level concerns. And it's fairly easy, believe it or not, to tell that <laughs> from a CV, you know, like what, where have put people put their time and attention? And if it's, you know, into publishing in nature and science, not that that's not great, but I think it's also, um, it's not the experience that you need to, to be able to really work at a, at a local level and deal with the concerns at a local level where, um, like, you know, some of the projects I explained, those are not things that are gonna, you know, get you in the New York Times. It's it's actually just this deep work that needs to be done. It's often technical assistance. So if you find that kind of work satisfying, I would say, you know, jump, jump into it and meet the people who are actually doing it and start working on projects with them. They're often very open to it. Awesome. Okay, we're, let's see, we got about five minutes left. Are there any final questions for Faith? I see there's also a nice comment from Kyung Su. Just saying um, that you, it's rare to hear from scientists who talk about their identity and relate that to the science. And it's heartening that your presentation involves diverse voices and clarifies from whom the voices are coming from. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it's really, um, it's really interesting how we kind of, you know, create these personas that are so separate in some ways. And that's what makes for a good scientist and, or that's the conception of what makes for a good scientist. But what I was really trying to do with this book was, um, many of the science communication books that are written are sort of from this top down level. And what I really wanted to do was concentrate on the actual people doing the work and see what emerged from that. And I think it's a very different story than what you would get if you were trying to sort of, um, you know, make up <laughs> what science communication is or only focus on the, the people who are thought of as the best science communicators, because in reality, um, you know, the, the workforce doing this work is, is just entirely different than, than the folks that gets talked about. And therefore, the actual skills and what we think of as good science communication work is, in my mind, pretty off base for what's actually getting done out in the world.
Kelly, I can I can jump in with a question if you can oh, hear me. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, I was like back channeling with another grad student, and we were like, "Yes, yes!" <laughs> like every other slide, we we're just yeah. Awesome. So I'm, thank I'm you. A, I'm a PhD candidate, um, and I really resonated when you were with the concept of standing in the gap. Um, mm -hmm. My research is with a multiracial squad of of urban farmers and gardeners. Um, and I, I could see how I do that in my own work. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on um, how you think uh, scientists need to like pivot or support ourselves um, in, in gaining those, those skills to, to be able to stand in the gap. Um, I'd just love to hear your perspective. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, I, I really think, you know, that the conversation I had with Mila was so profound in a lot of ways. And um, I think what she said about that was so important because she was really talking about how people get misinformation, um, and particularly in her community, sort of black community in Chicago, urban Chicago, and, you know, saying that, you know, a lot of the things that that people may have information about were things that were told to them by people who they really respect or maybe relatives. And so when you're really going to try to say to them, no, that's that's a really wrong way of thinking about it, whether it's about vaccines or climate change or whatever, um, the way we tend to approach that in science communication is uh the opposite of emotionally intelligent, um, you know, and so I think it's I, that that umbrella term of emotional intelligence, I think, is is a challenging <laughs> one in some ways, but I also think it's a useful one in others. You know, which is to say, in the sciences, we tend to really prioritize, um, you know, the brain um, and forget about the body, forget about the fe about feelings, forget about just any other part of us that isn't sort of our brain. And so, um, you know, I I think it's an uphill battle in a lot of ways to think about how this kind of thing could be integrated um, on a broad scale. Unfortunately, I think it's sort of what Julian said that it's really about, you know, um, getting lucky, having a good advisor, all of those kinds of things. Um, but the thing that I would say, you know, if I, if I were looking to and the way that I've tried to gain some of those skills um, is, you know, through, so um, graduate school, like for many people sent me into my own sort of deep therapy process, which helped a lot with just, you know, thinking about the ways that um, all of this stuff got neglected, <laughs> not got neglected in my training. And so I think, you know, there's different avenues, one, one of which is to, you know, really push to, and I do know some students who are doing this now, push to take courses in social work, take close courses in um, psychology, you know, so that you're really um, preparing yourself for this kind of work. And I actually know several, three people who have post PhDs decided to pursue master's degrees in social work or psychology because they really are trying to, you know, um, integrate this set of skills, people who've worked um, in hospice settings uh, to try to, you know, it, it, I think a lot of what's happening right now is people are just having these personal experiences that then kind of push them into wanting to be able to do, you know, make themselves a resource. So I think there are both intentional and, and sort of unintentional ways to go about it. But I think even seeing the value in it and then seeking out the kind of coursework and hoping that you have um, people around you who are supportive and see that as an important issue, which I know all of those are sort of massive caveats, but there is a path, you know, that's all I can say. There is a path. And so if you're willing to start following it, I do think it's there, even if it's faint. And I'm happy to talk with you more about sort of specifics. Thank you. All right, thank you all so much for the questions and for coming today. And thank you, Faith, so much for your time. Um, we're just about at five o'clock now, so I will let you go, but um, we will post this recording uh, on our website for um, if you wanna spread the word to anyone who missed the live session today. Um, and again, uh, we'll have Faith's contact information as well. So um, feel free to reach out to her uh, with more questions it sounds like she's open to that so thank you so much again Faith. yeah and thank you everyone for engaging today i know it's the end of your day so thanks for being here and listening i really appreciate it